Hello class. This week we will be covering chapter 11, DNA Biology in the Essentials of Biology textbook, 6th edition. So the first section we're going to start off with is going to be section 11.1, .1, DNA and RNA Structure and Function. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to understand how scientists determine that DNA was the genetic material, describe the structure of a DNA molecule, list the steps involved in the replication of DNA, compare and contrast the structure of RNA with that of DNA, and list the major types of RNA and describe their functions. Okay, so to start off with, uh, we talked a lot about Mendelian genetics last week, and so it's important to understand that Mendel actually knew nothing about DNA, the molecule, or how it worked. It took years for investigators to conclude that Mendel's factors, or what we call genes now, were on actual chromosomes. And there was a lot of controversy over whether DNA or protein itself was the actual genetic message or the material that saved information from generation to generation. And some of the first experiments that involved this idea of deciding whether or not DNA or protein was the genetic material was using viruses. And these experiments showed that only the DNA itself directed the formation of new viruses or the formation of new material from generation to generation. Okay. So, <clears throat> Some of the first evidence that DNA was the genetic material came from an experiment by Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase that involved the use of a virus called a bacteriophage that infected bacteria such as E. coli bacteria. And it causes the bacteria to manufacture more of the virus. These viruses were the ideal system to study whether the DNA or protein was the actual genetic material because viruses themselves are only composed of an outer protein layer or the capsid, which is made of protein, and then the inner core of the DNA. The experiment involved the labeling of proteins and DNA with different radioactive elements. And then from there, they tracked which of the material entered the bacterium. The results showed that the virus DNA and not the protein entered the bacteria and directed the, the formation of new viruses. And thus, that provided evidence to the fact that it was the DNA and not the protein that passed uh, information on from generation to generation. So within a few years, investigators had learned that genes are composed of DNA and that mutated genes resulted in the errors of metabolic function. The evidence was accumulating that DNA must ultimately control the operation of the cell. So here we have a visual representation of the experiments done by Hershey and Martha Chase. So essentially what they did was when they were studying these bacteriophages, so they are viruses that are made up of a protein capsid and inside that capsid is DNA. So they are just made of protein and DNA. They radioactively marked both the protein as well as the DNA in these viruses. And then from there, they tracked which item was incorporated into the next generation of viruses. And it turned out that it was the DNA alone uh, that had that radioactive marker that showed up in the next generation of viruses and none of the markers on the protein showed up. So that was evidence that it was the DNA itself and not the protein that was passed on from generation to generation. <clears throat> Okay, so now that we know that DNA is 
the actual genetic material that saves and harnesses that information for uh, new life. Let us look at the structure of DNA. So once researchers knew that DNA was the genetic material, the race between research teams began to determine the structure of DNA. While scientists did not yet know the actual structure of the DNA molecule, they did know its chemical components. The name deoxyribonucleic acid is derived from the chemical comp components of DNA's building blocks, which are the nucleotides. They also knew that DNA had the following characteristics. They knew that it had variability to account for differences in the wide variety of life on the planet. They knew that the ability to replicate that it had the ability to replicate so that every cell gets a copy during cell division. They knew that there was storage of, of the information needed to control the cell. And they knew that the DNA had the ability to change or to mutate to allow for the evolution of new species. Now, Erwin Kargoff was among the scientists trying to figure out the structure of DNA. And prior to Kargoff's work, many believed that the percentage of each base should, only, should not only be equal, but also the same between species. However, what Kargoff found is that each species has its own percentage of each of the type of bases. For example, in a human cell, 31% of the bases are adenine, 31% are thymine, 19% are guanine, and 19% are cytosine. In all the species of Kargoff's study, the amount of adenine or A always equaled to the amount of thymine or T, and the amount of guanine or G always equaled to the amount of cytosine or C. This relationship, this A is always equal to T and G is always equal to C, is what we call Kargoff's rule. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Kargoff's data suggest that DNA has a structure in which there are interactions so that adenine can only pair with thymine and guanine can only pair with cytosine. His data also showed that DNA can be variable and that is an important requirement for genetic material. <clears throat> and we also know from Kargoff studies that the amount of A, T, G, and C in DNA is going to vary from species to species. Today, we know that the paired bases may occur in any order and the amount of variability in their sequence is overwhelming. For example, suppose a chromosome contains 140 million base pairs and because any of the four possible nucle nucleotide pairs can be pr present at any pair location, the total number of possible nucleotide pair sequence is 4 to the 140 billion. OK. <clears throat> so we know that the building block of the structure of DNA is the nucleotide. And the nucleotide is the monomer of the nucleic acid, which is a polymer. Now we have touched on the structure of nucleotides before, but let us reiterate some of the structural components of the nucleotide. So every nucleotide contains a phosphate, which is present here. It also contains a five carbon sugar. Okay. In the case of DNA, this five carbon sugar is going to be a uh, um, deoxyribose. And then all of the nucleotides contain some sort of nitrogen containing base. There are four variations in that base in DNA, and that is, of course, going to be adenine, thymine, guanine, guanosine, and cytosine. <clears throat> okay, so among our variation in our base pairs, here are some more structural components to make note of. <clears throat> 
So again, we have our phosphate group, which is typically denoted here with a phosphate and is a single bonded to oxygens and then double bonded to one oxygen. We also have two variations of sugars. So in DNA, we have deoxyribose and RNA, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. The sugar in its structure is ribose. Okay, so there's a slight variation in the um, structure of the sugar, and that mostly has to do with this particular um, group here. So ribose has an extra oxygen, and DNA is lacking that oxygen, which is where we get the idea of deoxyribose, nucleic acid. Okay. Now, another, um, a few other structures of note would be with our base pairs. So there are actually uh, two different groupings of base pairs. We call them the purines and the pyrimidines. Okay, so the purines are the bases that have two carbon rings. Okay, so adenine is a purine and guanine is a purine. And they are purines, again, because they have two rings in their structure. And then the others, uh, Cytosine and thymine are uh, pyrimidines, and also uracil, but uracil is only present in RNA, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. And these um, base uh, pair, these bases, excuse me, only have one carbon ring. Okay, so that's just a few structural um, differences of note among the nitrogen containing bases. Okay. Okay. So let's dive into how we actually discovered the structure of DNA and how everything is formed and shaped. So the story of how we discovered it starts with Franklin. So Rosalind Franklin was a researcher at King's College in London in the early 1950s. She was studying the structure of DNA using X-ray crystallography where when a crystal or a solid substance whose atoms are arranged in a uh, definitive manner, so that's being a crystal, is x-rayed, the x-ray beam is diffracted or deflected. And the pattern that results shows how the atoms are arranged in the crystal itself. So first, Franklin made a concentrated uh, solution of DNA and then saw it could be separated into fibers. Under the right conditions, the fibers were enough that a crystal, that when they were x-rayed, a diffractive pattern resulted. The x-ray diffraction pattern of DNA is, shows that the DNA itself is actually a double helix. The helical shape is indicated by the cross X pattern in the center of the photograph, which we can see here. So this repeated sequence in this X pattern reveals that the DNA itself is actually a double helix. <clears throat> the dark area at the top and bottom of the photograph indicates that some portion of the helix is repeated many, many times. So that's what we are seeing. And then in this image here, it's just showing the basics of Franklin's setup. So she has an x-ray beam that is shown through a crystal. And in the right conditions, a certain um, diffraction or uh, deflected pattern is shown uh, from that x-ray beam. And because we got this pattern when DNA was shined through, we have the understanding that the structure itself is a helix. All right, so the next step in the story is with Watson and Crick. So in 1951, James Watson, having just earned a PhD, began an internship at the University of Cambridge, England. There he met Francis Crick, a British physicist who was interested in molecular structures. Together, they set out to determine the structure of DNA and to build a model that would explain how DNA varies from species to species, as well as replicates, as well as stores information and undergoes mutation. So based on the available information, they knew the following. 
they knew that DNA was composed of four types of nucleotides, with the base pairs being adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. They knew of Kargoff's rule at this point, where adenine always equals the same to thymine, and guanine always equals the same to cytosine. And then they also had Franklin's um, images, um, so Franklin's X-ray diffraction photography, and they knew that DNA is a double helix with a repeating pattern. So that's the information they had to work with. So using this data, Watson and Crick built a model of DNA out of wire and tin. The model showed that the deoxyribo sugar and the phosphate molecules are bonded to one another to make up the sides of the twisting ladder. Okay. The nitrogen bases made up the rungs of the ladder. Okay, so that's kind of what they're working on right here. And then they project essentially into the middle and hydrogen bonds with the bases allowed the bases to connect to each other to form those wrongs. And indeed, the pairing of A with T and G with C is called a complementary base pairing, and that results in those wrongs of consistent width as shown in the X-ray diffraction datum. The double helix model of DNA permits the base pairs to be in any order, which is a necessity for genetic variability between species. Also, the model suggests that complementary base pairing may play a role in the replication of DNA. As Watson and Crick pointed out in their original paper published in Nature in 1953, they stated, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. And for their work, Watson and Crick did end up winning a Nobel Prize for uh, their constructed model. So let us lay out all the components of the DNA structure now that we have the full story. So again, we know that DNA is a double helix and is like a twisted ladder. Okay, so that's what we're seeing up here. We also know that it is the deoxyribose sugar and the phosphate molecules that are bonded and they form the sides of the ladder. So the blue ribbon is that sugar phosphate group backbone. And we call this the sugar phosphate backbone, okay? And we also know that the base pairs make up the rungs of the ladder and the complementary base pairing allows for each of the rungs to be uh, the same length. And so it allows that molecule to have the same equal distant twisting in that double helix. And then finally, we also know that it is the hydrogen bonds between the bases that are going to hold the two halves of the helix together. Okay, And remember that hydrogen bonds are weak interactions between molecules of varying areas of opposite charges. Okay, And hydrogen bonds are important for maintaining a structure of a protein and DNA, but they can be easily broken. Okay, And this idea of the base pairs breaking apart is where replication as well as accessing the information to make proteins comes into play. And that is the overall summary of all the major components of the DNA structure. Okay, so now that we have discussed the structure of DNA, let us dive into how it is copied and passed on from generation to generation. So cells need to make identical copies of themselves for the growth and repair of tissues. Before division occurs, each new cell requires an exact copy of the parent cell's DNA. So it can be passed on to the next generation. DNA replication refers to the process of making an identical copy of a DNA molecule. <laughs> 
remember that DNA replication occurs during the S phase of the cell cycle that we discussed back in chapter eight. During DNA replication, the two DNA strands, which are held together by hydrogen bonds, are separated, and each old strand of the parent DNA is going to serve as a template for a new structure of a daughter um, half of the uh, DNA molecule. We call this process uh, semi-conservative because one of the two old strands is conserved or present in each of the daughter molecules. So in order for replication to occur, there are three main things that must happen. The DNA must unwind, and that is performed by the action of the protein helicase. You also have to have complementary base pairing in the new strand. And then once the new strand is formed, you have to join the two strands together. And that is the action of DNA polymerase as well as DNA ligase. And then once you have this process complete, the new DNA molecule is going to be an exact identical copy to the original molecule. Okay, so let's dive into a little bit more of the specifics of how this actually works. So to begin replication, the DNA double helix must separate and unwind. This is accomplished by breaking the hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides and then unwinding the helix structure using an enzyme called helicase. At this point, new nucleotides are added to the parent template strand. Nucleotides ever present in the nucleus will complementary base pair onto the non onto the now single stranded parental strand. The addition of new strands is completed by using an enzyme complex called DNA polymerase. The daughter strand is synthesized by DNA polymerase in the five prime to three prime direction. Any break in the sugar phosphate backbones are sealed by the enzyme DNA ligase. So the backbones of the parent molecule or the original strand is typically depicted as blue in models, and we'll see that in a second. And then following replication, the daughter molecules are typically denoted as a different color. In this case, it's going to be green. A daughter DNA double helix has the same sequence of base pairs as the parent DNA uh, double helix had. And the complementary base pairing has allowed the sequence to be maintained. So let us look at some visuals. Okay, so in this particular image, the parent molecule is noted as blue and the daughter, um, the new strand or the daughter strand is denoted as green. So there is some directionality in the DNA structure. So DNA always is added in sequence in the five prime to three prime direction. And because of the way that the sugar and phosphate groups are arranged in the sugar phosphate backbone, um, the arrangement on both sides of the double helix are what we call anti-parallel. So that means that one runs from the five prime to three prime direction and one runs from the three prime to five prime direction. And this comes into play um, during DNA replication and how DNA is replicated. <clears throat> so DNA or new uh, segments of DNA can only be added in the five prime to three prime direction. So when replication occurs on both sides of the parent strand, it is happening in opposite directions, okay? So one is being added one way and one is being added the other way because the new daughter sequence must be added in the five prime to three prime direction, okay? Now, the 
molecule responsible for unzipping that DNA again is helicase. So that's the enzyme helicase. DNA polymerase is the molecule that is synthesizing the new daughter strand. Okay. And then DNA ligase is reconnecting the hydrogen bonds as well as uh, any breaks in the uh, sugar phosphate backbone to make the whole double helix structure seamless once again. Okay. Now at the end of replication, what we're going to have is two semi-conservative model, uh, semi-conservative daughter molecules, where one daughter molecule has one half of the helix being the original parent strand and one half being the new daughter strand, as well as the other DNA molecule being one half the original parent strand and one half a new sequence of daughter strands. But because of the complementary base pairs where A and T always bind together and G and C always bind together, even though this is half new, the sequence is conserved from one generation to the next due to that complementary base pairing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more specifically about what happens in the eukaryote. So I mentioned a little bit um, in the previous slide, but let's talk a little bit more specifically about what happens. So in eukaryotes, DNA replication begins at numerous sites, and these locations are called the origins of replication. And they can happen along the length of the entire chromosome at multiple locations. At each origin of replication, a replication fork is going to form. Okay. And that replication fork is basically where that helicase is separating and unzipping the original parent strand of DNA. <clears throat> now, in the origin of replication, this unzipping is happening in both directions. So there's going to be a helicase that is unzipping this way, and there's going to be another helicase that is unzipping in the opposite direction. And that's going to form that bubble, which is what we call the origin of replication. All right. <clears throat> so it was it is within these replication bubbles that the process of DNA replication occurs. Repli replication proceeds along each strand in opposite directions until the entire entire double helix is copied. Okay. So remember that it is polymerase that is adding on new um complementary base pairs for the constructed daughter strand of DNA, and it can only add those strands in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So although eukaryotes replicate their DNA at a fairly slow rate, only 500 to 5,000 base pairs per minute, there are many individual origins of replication throughout the DNA molecule. Therefore, eukaryote Eukaryotic cells complete the replication of the diploid amount of DNA. In humans, that's over 3 billion base pairs in a matter of hours due to these multiple origins of replication and the replication occurring in both directions. Now, I did mention again that DNA um, can only be added onto the new daughter strand in the five prime to three prime direction. So one side, it can do that smoothly, okay? We call the side that can just continuously add uh, new uh, complementary base pairs for the daughter sequence, uh, the leading strand, because it can happen smoothly in one direction. However, the other side um, has to happen in fragments. And again, that is because the five uh, D, uh, DNA polymerase can only add that DNA in the five prime to three prime direction. So it has to start kind of really close to the helicase and add DNA molecule or uh, excuse me, add nucleotides um, in the opposite direction so that it can still add from five prime to three prime. And that has to do with that anti-parallel arrangement. So if I flip back here, so one strand has to be added from five prime to three prime this way and one has to be added from five prime to three prime this way okay <clears throat> all right so the one that has to the side that has to add fragments in our add daughter um, dna 
in fragments is what we call the lagging strand. And we call these individual fragments Okazaki fragments. Okay, So essentially what happens is that they start, uh, a DNA polymerase binds to uh, close to the helicase and then adds its daughter sequence away from the helicase. And it does this in fragments in order to, so as the helicase keeps moving down the DNA and unzipping it, a new polymerase will come in and start the sequence. And then another one will come in and start the sequence and so on and so forth. And these uh, segments are called the Okazaki fragments. Eventually, all of these fragments will be sealed together with DNA ligase. And that's what's happening right here to make it a continuous strand. And this whole reason for the Okazaki fragments is that directionality and how DNA polymerase can add daughter strands um, onto the parent template. And it has to do with that five prime to three prime direction. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so that covers the basics of DNA replication and what I expect you to know. So let us move on to RNA structure and function. Okay, so we've mentioned a few structural components of RNA already, but the essentials are that RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. In RNA, it contains the sugar ribose instead of deoxyribose. And I mentioned earlier that that ribose has an extra oxygen compared to deoxyribose, which is where the names come from. In addition to that, the RNA uses the base uracil in place of thymine. So uh, uracil, uh, or excuse me, RNA uses a, C, G, and U instead of A, C, G, and T. And the base uracil is going to uh, complementary pair with A instead. Uh, and just it basically takes the place of thymine, essentially. Another major structural component of RNA of note is the fact that it is single-stranded instead of double-stranded, which is what we see here. So that pho sugar phosphate backbone is still present. It's just we don't have a, an additional side to make it a helix-like DNA. So it is just single-stranded. Now, there are three major types of RNA. There's messenger RNA, which is uh, shorthanded to mRNA. There's transfer RNA, shorthanded to tRNA. And then there is ribosomal RNA, which is shorthanded to rRNA. So let us talk a little bit more specifically about the different types of RNA. All right. So to start off with, messenger RNA or mRNA is produced in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell, as well as in the nucleoid region of prokaryotic cells. DNA serves as a template for the formation of mRNA during the process of transcription. <clears throat> Which DNA genes are transcribed into mRNA is highly regulated in each type of cell, and accounts for the specific functions of all cell types. Once formed, mRNA carries genetic information from DNA in the nucleus to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm, where protein synthesis occurs during a process called translation. The next type of RNA is transfer RNA. So transfer RNA, or tRNA, is also produced in the cell nucleus of eukaryotes. Appropriate to its name, tRNA transfers amino acids present in the cytoplasm to the ribosomes. There are 20 different amino acids, and each has its own tRNA molecule. At the ribosome, a process called translation joins the amino acids to form a polypeptide chain. And then finally, the last major type of RNA is going to be ribosomal RNA. And at eukaryotic cells, ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, is produced in the nucleolus of the nucleus, where a portion of DNA serves as a template for its formation. Ribosomal RNA joins with proteins made in the cytoplasm to form the subunits of ribosomes. Ribosomes have one large subunit and one small subunit. Each subunit has its own mix of proteins and, T and um, 
or RNA, excuse me. The subunits leave the nucleus and come together in the cytoplasm where protein synthesis is about to begin. Proteins are synthesized at the ribosome, which look like small granules in low-powered electron microscopes. Ribosomes in the cytoplasm may be free-floating or in clusters called polyribosomes. Often, they are found attached to the edge of the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER. Protein synthesis by ribosomes attached to the ER normally are used by the ER. Proteins synthesized by free ribosomes or polyribosomes are used in the cytoplasm. A protein is carried in a transport vesicle to the Golgi apparatus for modification and then transported to the plasma membrane, which it can then leave the cell for use elsewhere. All right. And that is the basics of the types of RNA molecules present in cells. Okay, so the last thing we'll do in this section is kind of do a quick comparison of what is common for DNA and RNA and what is different for both. So the primary similarities of DNA and RNA, which are both nucleic acids, they are both composed of nucleotides, they also have a sugar phosphate backbone, and they both have four types of bases. So that's what's common between them. And then the main differences between DNA and RNA is that DNA is found in the nucleus and eukaryotes, whereas RNA is found in the nucleus and cytoplasm of eukaryotes. DNA is the actual molecule that holds the genetic material, whereas RNA is simply a helper to DNA to uh, transfer or process that genetic material. The sugar and the structures are different. So uh, DNA has the sugar deoxyribose and RNA has the sugar ribose. The base pairs are slightly different. So DNA base pairs are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And the base pairs in RNA are adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. DNA, of course, is a double-stranded helix, and RNA is simply single-stranded. And then the last major difference is DNA is transcribed to give a variety of RNA molecules, whereas RNA is translated to make proteins. OK, and that are the major similarities and differences between DNA and RNA.